I think there's, you know, in a way, modern architecture was defined about buildings being honest. Business of Architecture UK, episode 25. Hello and welcome, Architect Nation. This is the podcast for architects where you'll discover tips, strategies, and secrets for running an impactful and profitable design practice. On Thursday, the 11th of October 2018, Business of Architecture UK will be having our next live event at UNI offices in Howick Place in Victoria, London. We're going to be having a panel discussion with leading architects and entrepreneurs and industry thought leaders, and we will be discussing making money, profit, cash flow and making impactful architecture. Tickets have now gone on sale and the early bird tickets have now finished but you can still grab tickets. The link is in the information below so just click on that and it'll take you to an Eventbrite page and I look forward to seeing you there. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. This week I'm speaking to Ben Allen of the studio Ben Allen which is based in Hackney. And again, this was a really wonderful conversation with one of London's most innovative and exciting young practices. And Ben really goes into a lot of detail because he worked with um, Oliver Iliasson for many years and Jonathan Tucky and Fletcher Priest. Um, And it's a really interesting background of architecture and art and how he's kind of combined this experience and brought it into a very innovative architectural practice that's doing some very beautiful and exquisite projects and how they're maintaining that balance of um, innovation, of design research and execution of projects whilst maintaining a profitable business. So there's plenty of information here for you to get stuck into. Hope you enjoy this interview. Sit back and enjoy. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture. I'm here in East London at Studio Ben Allen with founder Ben Allen. Welcome to the show. Thanks very much. Absolute pleasure to be here. Now, you've had quite a fascinating career. You've worked for Fletcher Priest Architects, you've worked for Jonathan Tucky, and also you spent quite a considerable amount of time actually in the art world working for Oliver Iliasson. Uh, and now, about four years ago, am I right, you've set up yep. this practice. So, and, and some of the work that you do is absolutely, it's beautiful, it's really, really exquisite, and it operates in an interesting territory between architecture and you know, and the art world. So how, how did the practice begin? Um, well, it was on the back of leaving Berlin and working in uh, Eliasson's uh, or Eliasson's um, studio. And I, I was, I'd been, I'd set up a, a sort of a arts organization, um, sort of interdisciplinary organization, which we'd been collaborating with various artists in Berlin and we'd been doing some competitions and um but i also wanted to return to london um because i saw it as a as a slightly more sort of fertile place to start a practice right um the sort of creative industries here are very strong and i saw it as being a much in some ways an easier place to run a practice Mm. i think the the um one of those reasons being the amount of small residential projects which is the sort of lifeblood of blood of small practices in yeah in um berlin People tend to buy apartments and they buy furniture and that's in, and they repaint them and that's about as far as it goes. So it's you know the the, the making the step from working in practice um, and to to running your own practice. Obviously, there's a sort of is a well, the main the first main hurdle is um, where do you get your first projects? Yeah. And um, I actually was thinking of going to Hong Kong and I actually got offered a position at OMA in Hong Kong and. The guys that were interviewing me were saying, "Well, why would you want to come and work here?" And as they've been, that sort of uh, may have been one of my hero practices. I was it made me sort of think twice and sort of I should really just get on and do this. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's too late. So yeah, that was um, that was the beginning, and I I started to say just four and a half years ago. And um, and was it a straight sort of plunge into it, or did you kind of was there moonlighting involved, or no? It was pretty straightforward plunge into it. I um, I was planning on going sort of away for a month just after I got back and I I was basically doing some sort of 
background work for a couple of weeks and I managed to get two very tiny projects which actually kept me busy for most of the month I was mm. away so I didn't really have much of a break but it's been sort of fairly steady um, you know by purely I, I you know largely by luck those first few projects it's uh, generally it's through your sort of personal network yeah of like family friends friends of friends um, my network here because I've been away for so long was relatively small so I do think I was quite fortunate to get those um, first projects which really just give you that sort of kickstart. Mm. And what was it like making the transition out from being an architect in the arts world back into being a practicing architect working on residential projects? That's quite a, you know, if you're working for, for a studio on a failure and, and then going back into this world of residential projects, how was that transition for you? Well, I, um, there was definitely a shock in terms of uh, having, uh, you know, the, the projects we did in the art world uh, were on relatively tight budgets and they were very you know incredibly demanding in terms of timelines and they were very complex so it's i think a lot of people have an idea that the arts world the art world you know it's relatively easy mm. you know, for, for one reason or another whether it's because you don't have to justify what you do creatively which isn't necessarily true either um or that you know the budgets are big or you know the the, the deadlines are much more extreme you know right. you cannot miss the opening of an exhibition, for example, yeah. Uh, most we I worked on a lot of sort of pavilions, and uh, you know that it, it, the the deadlines are equally. You know, you're building a large, complicated thing, which is often permanent mm. and not just pop up thing. And you know, uh, so in some ways, it, it, just different sets of pressures. I think um, one of the, the first things was obviously dealing with clients. I dealt I dealt with end users and I dealt with a lot of participators in projects and whether it be galleries but obviously when you have somebody of Eliasson's reputation you know people tend to go with a very sort of open mind as to what they want and I think one of the most tricky things when you for a very small practice starting out is that a lot of people you know that there is a rightly an idea that a client will come and tell you what to do and you do it yeah and there's another idea of architecture which is you go with a much more comprehensive idea of what you'll do and you'll design something much more from the top to the bottom yeah and that and that that was quite tricky to begin with just to sort of um you know i think now we people come to us and we have much more to show them in terms of um what you know what the end result is and of course I know from working with John Huntucky you know there I worked with him he'd set up about a year beforehand or a year and a half he'd, he'd finished his first project and it got widely published he had a queue of people saying I want exactly that so already the reference was his own work because I hadn't done any residential projects mm. um, building up you know a number of projects you can show people and they can say oh you know I like that and still when you you're you're working through a network then Often then people come and they don't necessarily know your work already. They know so you, they, yeah. Yeah, so they know you. So you show them the work and then they might say, well, like, you know, it's quite interesting, but it has something a bit different. So I think as time goes on, it that gets easier because you have more to show people. You know, hopefully your reputation develops and people come to you because of what you do mm. and not through the fact that they're, you know, um, a friend of a friend of a friend. And so that's, um, that's something which I don't think is... You know, I think some people, I mean, one thing we've been doing in Berlin was um, entering competitions. And I think somebody had once said to me, you know, don't expect to win until you've done 10 competitions. And we won um, just as I set up. Like the first thing we did actually in those two weeks was doing a competition for an art project for Hackney Council. And we, we, that was the 10th and we won it. Mm. So it was very like good advice. And um, we won it and then the project got put on hold for two years after Hackney Council asking us to get out a million pounds worth of insurance so it was it was um so um yeah so that was you know but I actually I, I at that point I think I'd already decided I didn't really want to do competitions I, that might change but in a way I having spent several years sort of while working for Elias and that was sort of what I did in my free time yeah when working with different artists we did a lot of competitions and sort of um, open calls and I you know it was such a huge investment of at that point all my free time but it was um I, you know I think I just when I started the practice I thought it wouldn't be great to put that energy 
into sort of researching things that we were right. really excited by. And that's kind of what we still do. And we've, we've managed to get this far without doing any competitions. And, you know, as I say, that might change. But I think, I, personally, I think it's just a, it's, it, you know, the, the, I think some invited competitions, maybe, you know, often you, you sort of look at it and you try and work out what you think the odds are. Yeah. Um, but I think it also leads to certain, I think, you know, either you do it, when we started doing competitions when I was in Berlin and we, did it, we didn't have an interest in winning, we were just doing it as a vehicle mm. for do, doing what we wanted to do, and yeah. that was great. And to be honest, in some ways we did better doing that. As soon as you start getting closer to winning, you get runner, you know, you became runner-up, and then we're like, right, we need to start getting, winning a couple of these, then actually it somehow gets further, because you sort of, I think naturally you end up sort of second-guessing, and, you know, the briefs are often quite convoluted, and... And you don't have that dialogue with an end user, which I think is actually really interesting. Yeah. Um, and also the ability to have a conversation, explain what your ideas are, and and so yeah, we my, my sort of the, if there's a, a model in that respect, it's that we try and sort of put a lot more of our time into into sort of research on the projects we're doing, and that often they're sort of hobby areas of interest. Right. Say hobby in the sense of it, but you know. What kind of areas are you kind of focus your research into? Because that's really interesting. Because I would have thought that your practice would have been doing a lot of competitions due to the nature of some of some of the work, like the uh, the Folkestone um, Triennale. Um, how how does that how do products like that come? Is that kind of coming from a research um, perspective or? Well, that came back because somebody dropped out, and we happened to be in the right place at the right time. Right. Um, I was about to go to the states and. And um, I was there about two hours after we got the call. It's very easy to get from East London to Folkestone. So I think just because we were keen and they had about two months before the opening, we, um, you know, obviously they liked what we did. You, you know, they liked the work I could show them. So it was, hopefully it's not just because of that. But it was, you know, in some ways, again, it, there, there's very, so many different circumstances that rise, you know, lead to projects arriving on our desk. I mean, the fact is, yeah, that when... You know, it's, I think it's what you make of it, and in many ways, even the Folkestone thing, I think that maybe there's an expectation. It was given to us as an art commission. Um, having worked in the art world, I mean, I'm very happy being an architect. I, lo I love making buildings. Yeah. And part of my leaving art, you know, coming back to London is because I, w I want to make architecture, and I think there's a there's a worryingly large gap between fun architecture projects and real architecture, and I think I, I like the idea of trying to sort of cross over that gap and mm. make real buildings as interesting as some of the sort of things that a lot of graduates want to work on, you know, sort of pop-up projects and yeah. try and, try and you know, and, and obviously the, you know, there's a lot of constraints there, but, you know, going back to the Folkestone project, um, I think maybe there was an expectation that we'd do something which was like a, you know, piece of furniture of some sort because it was also, it was an art project, but it was the touchdown space for the triennial and so it had to have a, some shelves and some seating and an information desk. Mm. And it would be easy to spend the budget on that. And we spent the budget on almost anything but that. And we just made the shelves and the seating and the desk the most crude, simple things they could be yep. that cost a small fraction of the budget. And so even that was, you know, um, in a way we just invested. And, you know, we worked, we sort of almost dropped everything and worked solidly for two months just to, to realize something which was, you know, maybe... You know, quite different to what the expectation could have been to do with what that space would have been. So, I think, um, yeah, that coming back to the kind of research, there, you know, a lot of it's to do with ways of building, mm. ways of making things. Um, we're doing a concrete project at the moment, which is a house which is um, going to be all fabricated offsite out of pigmented um, co structural concrete, which is also patterned. Um, and it's all going to be built in a day. So, um, so how, how do you get your clients to take these kinds of uh, directions with their projects? How do, you, how do you win them over to have them on board? To, or how, how do you balance your research interests into a, a, you know, a, a project? Um, well, I think being very enthusiastic is one <laughs> thing that helps. I mean, I think, you know, if people think... It, it, you know, with that project, we sort of said, well, we, we think we can make this affordable. Mm. It won't necessarily be cheaper than building it another way. 
but we think we can do something exceptional for the same price, maybe 5% more in terms of that part of the construction or 10% more, but within a relatively small margin that will be quite exceptional, uh, you know, in terms of, you know, will actually be something that other architects will be interested in, um, you know, to do something as elaborate with, you know, I, in our, it, our interest was like, well, you know, one of our, our areas is we're interested in really solid buildings, yeah. buildings that are sort of quite monumental. And so we've done a sort of brick, load bearing brick vault. And I think clients are interested in the way things are made. And I think you just have to, you know, I think that's where the difference between the idea of, you know, you employ an architect and they, you tell them what you want and the color scheme and you go shopping with them. I mean, I'm, I think there is a sort of part of the, you know, there is the risk of sort of becoming a stylist, which is also a great job. I mean, it's very nice. It's just something that we were never really interested in mm. and that you end up, you know, sort of going shopping with your clients and choosing things. But, you know, in a way, we're not necessarily that interested in the taps and all these other things, although we spend quite a lot of time fiddling around things like that. We actually try and the way the building is made is more interesting. And I think if you if you sort of can be really excited about that and you have interesting ideas and I think clients are willing to listen mm. and to say, yeah, that sounds great. I mean, we said we're going to build it in a day. Of course, they all thought that was great as well because it would be a much quicker way of building. Yeah. The house. Or they didn't realize that it would take six months in planning to build it in a day. But, <laughs> but basically, it's, it's, you know, it's still hopefully an efficient way to build. And, and you know, in some ways, they also get their value for money because, you know, we have an interest and it's, we sort of invested quite heavily in that project in order to make it happen. Mm. Um, so, you know, um, and, and we've done that with a lot of our projects. So in some ways, there is, there is I'd say the risk is that something that maybe isn't done as often as other ways of making things. But, um, you know, you, the sort of compensation is that obviously we, we had to kind of go the extra mile to, mm. uh, to make it work. And also, and even because even in terms of fabricators, there's not that many people that do small projects that, you know, will, will, you know, so we have to spend a lot of time talking and reassuring fabricators that it's not going to be too complicated yeah. to do these things. And that, and so that requires us to really doing our homework and understanding, so, um, you know, how it works. And so we've got, um, one area is, you know, doing, is doing precast concrete. Another is timber structures of which there's quite a few on our website, but, um, looking at um you know and again trying to find inexpensive ways of doing things and i think if you tell if i think you know by making it affordable obviously that's something which wins people over and and we're very keen to show that these things are affordable yeah and i think you know a lot of um sort of machine fabrication it is changing what you can deliver um it still requires a huge amount of work on our part and it still doesn't mean it's easy for the contractor to put together but if it's the centerpiece of the design and they know that's the main part of what you're doing, yeah. then I think that's, you know, the, it's, it's also just a way we communicate it and say, well, this, you know, if we're doing it for somebody's house, it's, there's going to be this amazing ceiling and it's going to be fantastic and it's going to be something you look at every day and it'll, you know, the light will come through it in this way or reflect off it. And, yeah. and you know, so it's about the emphasis <coughs> you put and those small, particularly like, all the projects we've done, we try and find a sort of central emphasis that we then it allows us to to really, you know, hope, uh, over time we see a sort of pattern of these areas of interest, which we call sort of research areas, mm. uh, whether they be health and well-being in the workplace, um, which is about, which then a lot of it's about the sort of, you know, we're very interested in, partly maybe because of my time working with Elias and the sort of sensory side of architecture, how buildings particularly sound, um, how, you know, the materials they're made of, you know, does a timber frame building made of a filigree timber structure sound, you know, how different is it to a solid concrete yeah. building and how can you make those both great things? It's some of the things that people really enjoy, I think. Um, so how, how do you know when to say no to a project then? And do you, do you ever take on projects where, it, which for example, might be more commercially based and that would that would allow you to be able to go down a sort of more, uh, you know, intense design route on another project? Or, or does that not work within your sort of your business model? Uh, well, I don't, we haven't necessarily been very good at saying no to projects. <laughs> so I'm not sure. I mean, I think 
Um, there's definitely in a few projects which we didn't get that I think was probably a good thing we didn't get, but maybe mm. some slightly more commercial, <clears throat> large-scale workplace projects that at that time would have kind of just taken over everything else we did. Um, we, we started doing workplace projects about three and a half years ago, and again, it was through a, a connection, and, and it was also, I mean, being a small practice, one of the things is often that time is quite, in terms of... Um, you know, one way of getting projects is by being keen and easy, you know, able to jump onto things quite quickly. So again, it was a client who had quite a short time frame. Right. And they were a firm of engineers and I'd worked with them in the past. And they, um, yeah, and I'd never really thought about doing workplace design. And, you know, we looked at it and we were saying, we sort of said, well, most of the money is in the furniture. And that's actually, you know, so we could just go and buy lots of furniture. Um, and, and at the same time, there was all the stuff about sitting as the new smoking, and how, and we so we just went and had quite a long conversation about desks. We talked about how architects and engineers used to have these great standing desks, and um, and that they used to have a sort of really good, you know, workspaces with ergonomic chairs, and how we just all worked in the same offices, and what an engineer's office would look like in the twenty first century. We ended up designing a desk system for them. And just saying, well, it's about really good quality desks, and and um, and then because there was sort of discussion about health in the workplace, there was they sort of said, well, we've heard about this thing called the Well Standard, and we ended up doing this new, it's a new American standard about health and well-being in in buildings, and um, and it was great because it was a vehicle with which to. Um, for them, they did their own research into water filtration and air quality, which was really useful for them. And for us, we were looking at how things, you know, glues and how things are made. And actually, in terms, you know, it's a bit like home cooking. If you make things yourself, then you know what's in them. So within six months, we sort of suddenly had this new expertise, which mm. is health and well-being in the workplace. So I mean, yeah. it's really, you know, it's an incredibly intense period where not only were we doing the first workplace project, I would, worked on Vodafone's headquarters at the very beginning of my career, but that was, you know, 15 years before that. And so suddenly to be thrown in designing a space for 200 people and we're designing a modular desk system. And as on top of that, we, you know, we ended up designing a shelving system for them and doing the well standard, which nobody had done in Europe at that time. And none of the companies knew how any of their products complied. So we were building all the front of house furniture as well. And then, you know, it was a, it was a real very fast learning curve but it was it was a great way to get into the into into the workplace yeah. area and you know so so in a way i'm sure there's lots of other companies that maybe approach things in a not dissimilar way but it was it i think um yeah somehow those investments have tended to pay off pay dividends back I think, mm. whenever we've done projects that um and sometimes not knowing the the sector you're in having to make that huge step it's actually very beneficial because you just learn so much in a short period of time mm. and also i don't know if we necessarily have designed our own desk system have we done several offices before <laughs> i think there is a sort of slight naivety which sometimes means you you really push to do a lot more than you might otherwise do mm. and that's that could be really healthy as well so uh, it's interesting as, as a small practice you're accumulating a large amount of very specialist expertise how do you retain that? How do you um, how do you sell it? How do you market it? Um, it? That's one of the most difficult things. I mean, when I started the practice, I remember speaking to some um, uh, sort of business consultants at a friend's party, and I was just sort of saying to them, "What you know? Do you have any advice?" And of course, they said, "Well, we don't know anything about architecture because I don't know how many architects you know people. It's quite a niche area." Um, but they, you know, every, they sort of came back to this thing of what's your unique selling point, mm. and and actually over time, I think I realised it's actually it's quite disingenuous because I think a lot of people that have the, have distilled what they do down to that have done it over quite a long period of time, and actually they do it with hindsight. <laughs> so when you're yes. <laughs> starting out, you don't actually know what it is yet, and you don't necessarily want to pigeonhole yourself because you don't say, I just want to do kitchen extensions because most people don't. Yeah. And a lot of architects start out doing stuff they don't necessarily want to do in the long term. So it's a sort of stepping stone. You don't necessarily get to do the commissions that you dream of doing on mm. day one. Um, and by that means, it's also kind of a waiting game that you, you know, 
I think a lot of people say it takes 10 years to get to a certain level of, you know, even just in terms of the way the business runs and the reliability and the fact that, you know, you can do certain things with your business and being sort of probably you know, about halfway through that process, I really see that now that there is a sort of gestation period, which I think is quite healthy. So for us, we're sort of enjoying it while we can. Mm. Just, there's a, and it's in a way why, you know, I, when I sort of graduated, most people didn't be, seem to be starting their practice till they were in their sort of mid forties. And then I went mm. to Berlin for 10 years and I came back and, and then this had dropped by 20 years. So suddenly I was like, well, I should really get on with this. But, um, but I still think like the 10 years I spent in Berlin working in art world was also, you know, I do think that there's a sort of timeliness and that you can't necessarily, that there is a sort of certain, you know, these things can always go faster. And I'm sure if you get lots of commissions and you expand the business and you bring in great expertise, but I also think then the knowledge passes down a different way. So uh, yeah, the, the second part of your question is how do you kind of keep that knowledge? I think that's, that's a, I think that's a real challenge for a small business. And that's something that is, we're just still kind of learning mm. how to do that and obviously trying to keep people, but you know, by, by nature, you know, you have a lot of people who are just out of college and so you know, people that aren't from the UK and then they want to go somewhere else. And so there's a, you know, it's very transient. I think that's really healthy. And so we try and keep a sort of community of people that work with us and so that they feel they can come back and we mm. meet up quite regularly. And so that's one attempt to do it. Um, we try and have our systems really well set up so that everyone can find everything and that we sort of do things in a certain way. And for small practices, that's not, that's not always easy to do that because you're always changing things all the time. Yeah. Like, you know, and it's also, it's quite, it's a sort of fun part of doing it. You're constantly making new ways of doing everything and making it more developed. So there's always a sort of backward compatibility. Like if somebody goes into an old project, can they actually find the way around? Yeah. Can they find the key drawings? How much time do you spend archiving things? I mean, this is something that I'm sure all, every practice you know, struggles with or, or you know, has to kind of deal with and work out. But I think, yeah, that's something that's really important. I think making models is always great because you have you know, bits of prototypes of things because you have evidence around you. And I think that's, you know, people can actually see things that were done in the past and it reminds people of, there was this project where we were doing this with timber rather than what we're doing most of the time. Yeah. You know? So I think, yeah, that's a, that's a really big challenge. It's something I'm really conscious of being, it's sort of almost like the project for the next five years is how to keep, how to keep this. The intellectual assets, base. yeah. Yeah, and how to kind of grow that more mm. very small team. And also because you fluctuate in numbers as projects come and go. And I think, and you know, it's, it's the balance of that is also, um, you know, just being hell bent on staying, you know, the, our, you know, so we were a tiny practice and, you know, at some point we were five people and then we were four people and three people and then we we're four again and we we're three again. And so it's, you know, and, and next year it might be twice that number or it might just be me. And so, but I think that if you're sort of hell bent on keeping the number of people, then, you know, I think that can also be unhealthy, even though, you know, not because you, you know, it's really important, you know, to invest in people, but it's also... It, it can dictate the kind of work you do. Right. And so that's, that, and I think a lot of, you know, even with bigger practices, that's the same. It's like if there's less work, do you, you know, in some ways it can be great because it pushes you to go and look for things in other areas. But in some ways it means you, you don't choose as much what you do and naturally just in the back of your mind. And it's a, I mean, um, you know, my background, my father was an architect as well. And okay, so it's a lineage of architects. Yeah, well, and, uh, you know, I know that the pressures of, he was a partner in a practice, um, but, you know, the pressures of of running a small medium, I think at some point they were, you know, 50, 60 people, mm. that's a huge pressure, and I think at some point that becomes the thing. It's just, it's, it's feeding the beast, it's just keeping it going. Yeah. And I think that, that's a real challenge in a creative enterprise is like, yeah, with balancing that but with with the you know the reasons why you wanted to do it in the first place. Yeah, and and the kind of clients you want, and and the type of work you want to do, and and I think over the lifespan of a practice, whatever that is, 
you know, I think those things obviously change and mm. you, you change the way, you know, and I'm sure in five to ten years' time we'll have very different ideas about where we're going about things and we'll sort of laugh at the naivety of some of the things we're doing now. But I think, yeah, I think that is the ultimate challenge, though, is just the flexibility, keeping it flexible and still feeling like every, you know, you're not losing the, the sort of losing information by, you know, people who've worked on a project are leaving. And I think, but it's also healthy that people go and, you know, do other things. I think the idea that we sort of try and create like a network and people do come back and work on things. Yeah. And that also helps if you do need to say to people, well, can you help with this or even give advice? It's really useful. And yeah. I quite like the idea that, that you know, that it's kept like that. And I, I mean, again, maybe that in that case, we're not that unique. I'm sure other practices are like that. But, you know, it's also an effort to try and keep it very sociable and communal. And working in the art world, I mean, we all sit and have lunch together every day and, and you know, we sort of cook together. And so trying to make it, trying to make it a sense of community, mm. trying to, you know, not make a sense of community, but foster a sense of community is, is important in that respect because I think it does sort of um, make, you know, it does keep people this idea of it's something that people will look back on and go, oh, that was a really interesting experience. And um, they're more like to drop in and let me know what they're doing. And then, you know, it's just, it is also because maybe because I wasn't in London and I didn't study in London, I don't really have this, this network. <laughs> so in some ways, of course, all the people, you know, it's really nice to have a you know, group of people that you touch base with and when they go and work for other people, that's also really interesting. So. And you were saying something interesting earlier as well about um, so many young students now, people are, you know, the age of starting a practice has kind of dropped quite significantly why do you why do you think that is and what do you think are the benefits and the the dangers facing young practices um well i think i think this it's i wouldn't say i think there's maybe too much said about whether you're millennial or not millennial i say that because i'm not millennial but i think there's maybe i i just sort of act in that same mind frame but i think people people like the idea of running their own business i think you see that in all sectors um and you know, not just in London or across the UK. So I, I think, um, I think architecture has always had, and I, you know, has, has sort of fetishized the idea of running your own practice. And you know, I'd be a hypocrite to say I don't think that's a great thing. I do think it has its drawbacks in the fact that, um, you know, I think other, I think part of the reason that architecture, you know, that architects don't get paid very much, for example, is because there's thousands of tiny practices and there is a sort of undercutting. Mm. And if you look at other sectors like, you know, the legal world, there's a lot, you know, setting up your own, if it was a family law firm and in somewhere quite provincial and that's quite normal, but for a lot of areas of law, most firms are like, you know, small firms are several hundred people and big firms are thousands. And naturally that, that I think they can protect Mm. themselves in a different way when they have that scale um i think it's i think it's a, having said that i think uh it's a really it's a sign that i think a lot of architects you know they really care about what they do and they want to do something good um you know in if for, for whether it be the planet society their community or just because they like making things and they think it's they sort of share that enjoyment by you know um doing what they're passionate about yeah then i think I actually, you know, so in some ways it's a dilemma which the architect, which is, faces the architecture profession, which is that I think generally it's a relatively nice profession. People go into it with the right, the right sort of, you know, wanting to do the right thing. And I think, um, you know, and I think uh, if it comes down to sort of egotism of running your own practice, um, you know, in some ways I set up my own because I didn't really think I fit it in any other places and also because of my experience was so, was quite unique and I just yeah. didn't know how to... Deal, deal with that and I, I do think at some level there's a sort of thing that there's you, you do, there's no respect unless you you know that's the best thing to do is set up your own practice and that's any way your peers will respect you and I think that's that is a shame and I think it also reflects not very well on bigger practices mm. and I actually think some of the bigger practices are doing great work um, I think part of it is this scalability difference between doing smaller projects where you can design every bit of them and and also the sort of idea of you know when I worked in the art world I went and lectured quite a bit at architecture at various different architecture schools and I'd always be talking to people about what great skill sets architects have and and 
I think is actually sad in a way. I mean, again, it's hypocritical because I went to work in the art world, but I do think it's sad how many architects end up working, you know, in other fields. Not because I think it's it's great to do an architecture degree and go and do something else, but I also think it's because, we've, you know, you train to have a huge skill set. Yeah, it's kind of ridiculous what you come out of architecture school being able to do, and and it, it's relatively inexpensive for a lot of people. So they just say, well, this is great, you know. Um, if you're, you know, an artist, you can get lots of architects to come work in your art studio, and they can do loads of great things for you. Um, so there's another sort of dilemma there. Is to, well, that's that's we should be celebrating that, but it's also like, well, we don't want to be the sort of most underpaid corner of all creative <laughs> professions. <laughs> everyone, and everyone's sites, everyone's leveraging architects and, like, in there. Filmmakers. Yeah, everyone's, and so I think that's, and I, so you know, I, and I think the fact that a lot of people are disenfranchised with the career of being an architect. Yeah. I think there's a there's a problem there. And and also part of what we're doing here is you know, is which is why I think we're really keen not, you know, to kind of progress the firm because I think I would like to I'm keen to sort of try and lead by example and sort of say, you know, you know, there are really exciting ways to make buildings. You would love making a model on a CNC machine. Well, you can make a building like that and it can be a really fun building. And your clients will like it because it doesn't cost them the earth. Uh, and it's a really efficient way of making if you don't end up chucking all the bits away like your model at college. But, you know, if you, if you take it really seriously. And, I mean, working in the art world, that's one of the things we did. You know, it's, it's really serious. There's no waste. The budgets are tight. There's no time for test. You know, things have to be done really thoroughly. And so, and that's also, you know, that's very, you know, enjoyable. But, you know, there is a way of working, I think, which is you know, can deliver great results for clients and, you st and you're making real buildings. Yeah. And, and hopefully you can make them, you know, really exciting at the same time by really embracing some of the ways of making. And, and again, there's a lot of people doing these things. Um, but I think maybe there's not enough. And, you know, when it comes to mass housing, PFI school programs, you know, a lot of, you know, there was always the thing that most buildings weren't designed by architects. I think that's probably less true now. I mean, there's buildings, you know, look at the London skyline. I mean, it's all designed by architects. Mm. And a lot of it's really great. Is it inspiring the next generation? I don't know if it is. And are they thinking, I really want to be doing that? I don't know if they do. And I think, um, I think, you know, it, there, are, there are issues in the profession, which is, um, you know, I think trying to make the building of buildings exciting. And that also the detail of buildings exciting. And I think if you want a young architect to be really excited about going to work in a practice, if he works on the ceiling of the foyer is an exquisite timber lattice structure, <laughs> that's a really fun thing to get your teeth into. Yeah. And it doesn't have to cost the world. If it's just a bit of old plasterboard, um, because that's all you're ever going to do. And look, you know, if you ever think there's going to be anything other than a bit of old plasterboard, then you kind of think, you know, you're wishful thinking, mate. Then that's, that's really tragic. And I think that, you know, I think there's a there's a really exciting project which is to fall in love with the way we make buildings again. And mm. I think that a lot of good practices are, are doing. You know, say there's some amazing work going on. But I think um, I think there's you know in a way modern architecture was defined about buildings being honest. And in some ways, our buildings are the least honest they've ever been because they're all fabrications. They're all covered up. Everything goes on inside the walls. And um, and I think that's that, that you know maybe that makes it less exciting to get into actual making of yeah. buildings. So anyway, that's a <laughs> no, that's great. It's, it's very fascinating. I think we've just about hit our time. So thank you very much, Ben, for this interview. Absolute wealth of fascinating uh, wisdom there. Thank you. Well, it's a pleasure. I'm really glad you came and had a good chat. Thanks. So that is a wrap. Thank you very much for listening. And don't forget to go and book your tickets for the Business of Architecture UK live event happening on the 11th of October 2018 at UNI offices. Tickets now on sale. All the information is in the link below. Look forward to seeing you there. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.